thinking about going home, dreaming about leaving here. I'm ready to be moving on, and it won't be long before the sun will set, and I'll be gone, and I'm in trouble. Thinking about going home, thinking about going home, dreaming about leaving here. I'm ready to be moving on, and it won't be long before the sun will set, and I'll be gone. Thinking about home, and I'm thinking about home, home. Thinking about going home, dreaming about leaving here. I'm ready to be moving on, and it won't be long before the sun will set, and I'll be home. But until then, I'll be thinking about home. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, church. Is this on, Brother Greg? Okay. What an awesome day today. So thankful for each and every one of you here today. It's been a great service. I think Brother Mike's done a great job. All the singers, all the testimonies. Just and some of my some of the testimonies every time I think every time someone preaches, they can tell you that as you're waiting to preach, it seems like the testimonies start coming out, the same same things you're going to preach about. So it kind of confirms it. You had to kind of, you know makes you think about the other direction, but anyway, um, it's been a great week. Uh, we are getting ready for this party coming up, and I, I really pray that you invite your friends, neighbors, anyone to come. Uh, I'm going to have hay rides. Or there's going to be fireworks at dusk at night. Um, uh, fire, or the bonfire, cornhole, all that stuff. Am I forgetting anything, Sister Patty? Food, yes, I forgot about food. <laughs> yes. yes, there will be food. So um, there will be plenty to do. We're going to have the, uh, um, David is called L Louder Milk. Derek, Derek, Louder Milk Band. So I, I really liked that group when they was here last time. They really, I felt the love with them people and the songs were inspirational. So they'll be here to sing um, Under the Tent Saturday night. So I'm looking forward to a great event, and I hope everybody comes. And like I say, invite, each, invite your neighbors, invite your friends, and if we can touch one person, if one person can be touched and, and seek God over it, it's worth everything that would been happened to do it. Um, Paul wanted me to remind the church as well that today is the life change up in uh, the front of St. Michael's, correct, there in Plymouth? And it's from 2 to 3. Two to three, when they're standing up for the rights of the unborn babies, this is far from a, you know, there's some victories that's happened, and, but there's still plenty of setbacks in that whole, it's not fixed by any means about the protection of the unborn rights of the babies. So um, you're more than welcome to come. It's nothing more than they give you uh, signs and, you know, you basically hold the sign up along the road. You don't say nothing. You don't make a scene. You're just a a silent prayer in the public as they drive by and see you holding that. It's not, there's nothing, nothing we do to, you know, hey, look at this, you know. It's just something to make people think when they go by. Read the sign, make, make them think before they make that choice. And give them a reason to think about that choice before they do it. So I think it's extremely important. Um, looks like it's be a nice day for it. We've had times where it's been rainy and windy and cold and 
So I think today would be a pretty nice day, and it goes pretty fast, really. The time goes pretty fast. So I encourage everyone who would like to or could to come up and support the babies. Um, and I'll get started here. Um, like I said, it's uh, been a few weeks, and I've had this message ready for about three weeks <laughs> since I come back from hunting. And um, things change each week, and now I hear him today, and I'm, I still want to use part of that. And the whole time I was up here, God was challenging me on different things to go to today. Is a different testimony, the mood in the church. You know, I, I know that the rest of the minister, you can pick up on the mood of the church. You can pick up on the feeling of the people. And, you know, if there's one thing common in here today is everybody's fighting something. Amen? Everybody's fighting either an emotion, a real battle. Uh, it could be a money battle. It could be a marriage battle. It could be a neighbor battle. It's, it's something. And we're all fighting it. We're all fighting some kind of a battle. And I, and I look out over the crowd, and, I, and I'm not saying I look out of the crowd that I got this all figured out, because I do not have this all figured out. <laughs> um, there's one thing in common is I'm right with you on it. I'm being fought as hard as you are. Brother Mike's being fought. Pastor Howard's being fought as hard as everybody else in this church. Nobody gets a free pass on this. We're all going to have it hit us. And for the ones that are maybe judging some of us that's went through some hard times, on, yeah. hang on. Your turn's coming. <laughs> if you're going to be real about this, your turn's coming. If you haven't had a hardship yet that you're going to testify about that God brought you through, you need to get serious about God. Because he says in the Bible, think it not strange these fiery trials which come upon you. Why would he say that, Brother Dennis, if we were on that high road with no exits and no worries? No. We're on the road that has a million exits, and every one of them, your, your, your devil's trying to pull you off of them. Turn this way. Turn that way. And you know it's wrong, but we, we're, we're so... We always want the next best thing. That's the flesh. So you're always looking for something different. That's what we do. We really do. And, you know, this, this whole situation of, and I'll just be blunt. I'm not a very smart guy, and I, I usually tell things the way I see it and the way I feel about it, and that doesn't always make me popular. But, um, you know, we've all talked about it with my brother Mike and sister Sheila. You know what, if you don't think a battle's coming that could knock you off your feet, and, you know, the, you know this brother Mike is, and sister Sheila are extremely strong people in the Lord. You knew they were. I knew they were. But the devil knows every weakness we have. And he knows what to do to get us off track. And I have been there in my life, church. I've been there. Now, some of you have never been there. I'm, I'm, you know what? I'm glad for you. I am. I'm glad that you've never had that happen. But I've had it happen. And it's not a fun place to be. Because a day turns into two. Two turns into three. And three turns into two months and four months. And before you know it, it's been a year or whatever. And you look back and you say, you know, and I, when I make this comment to the church that you get to a place and I end up over here, and it's like the prodigal son. I come to myself, and I say to myself, how did I ever end up here? How did I end up right here? It's because the devil come through. And you know the times in my life when I have got out of church, I was fighting somebody else's battle. <laughs> Imagine that thinking I was sticking up for somebody else on a situation that happened with me and Paula 20-some years ago. It wasn't even my fight, but it took me out because I let it get a hold of me. Because, you know, I've learned if we trust God, and, you know, God's timing is not our timing. We, we can put time limits on it. We can put... You know, old Brother Dale was gone for a year, you know, 20 years ago. Brother Mike was gone for whatever months, whatever. You know what? 
Oh, my goodness. Oh, we, put, we put timing on stuff. Well, God doesn't care about our time. He does everything in his time. And, you know, there's been some of you in here I've seen that's been here, and you left for a while, and you're back. You know what? It's life. It's coming back home what counts. Right? Amen? Does anybody in this building have the power to judge anybody that walks back in this church? Anybody. Because if you are, I want you to stand up and come up here and tell me your credentials. Because I only know one that has them credentials. His name is Jesus Christ. No offense, but the rest of your opinions don't matter to me. I'm sorry. It's just, I got one to please. You have one to please. Jesus Christ. And he will let us, the Bible talks about walking through dry land, dry time, dry land, doesn't it, Brother Jim? It talks about where you're, we're going to feel like he's gone. And I'll guarantee you, I, it, 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 you know, the devil does this thing, and he's pretty good at it, but he's also pretty repetitive. Then he make you feel like nobody cares. You, you can't do that. You know, what are they going to say? How are they going to treat you? I've been through all this. I know what it feels like. But you know what? The second time around when I come back, I was a little smarter. We grow in our strength. We grow by trials. We grow by trials, Brother Tommy. If I've never had a trial in my life, I'll be the weakest person in this church. Spiritually, the weakest person in this church. Because our trials by faith are more precious to God than rubies and pearls and everything. Our trials for our faith. And what's that talking about? That's talking about, uh, do we really have it in us to do this? I'm going to share a little bit of my, uh, let's, let's all stand real quick. I just ask for, uh, God to bless the word today. I, I'm, I'm, I, I will get around to what I'm doing. Just bear with me a few more minutes. But uh, with the church, all the church say, uh, bless the word. Thank you, Jesus. Bless the word today, Lord, to have your way, Lord, and you would speak your words to us, Lord, and I'd just be a vessel you can use. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I say, we went on this uh, hunt, and to me, I've been on enough hunts in my life that I, I look for opportunities in the situations when I go do these things now, and it's not about opportunities trying to shoot something. I'm actually getting kind of soft. I haven't shot a deer for so long and an elk for so long. I really don't know if I can do it. Now, Randy, don't you laugh at me. I'm serious. I've been, especially when you archery hunt, you get so close to these animals and you're catching them unaware and they come in. It's like, man, them little fawns look like my little beast of little dogs. It's like I'm going to shoot my own little dog. And, uh, but I'm getting soft. So anyway, I look for other opportunities. I take the grandkids and let them enjoy the, you know, the mountains and all that. And, but this time around, we had a whole different opportunity. And a, a, a friend of mine that was clear back before my heart attack in Colorado, his name is Dusty. Believe it or not, another Dusty. He's from Colorado. And... Uh, He'd come out and elk hunt with us there, and uh, we would become really good friends. And his friend, uh, Ryan, he's a police officer from Boulder, Colorado. I met him, been friends since, like, 2012. And the brother, and the, and the Ryan was the one who was the officer to come up when I had my heart attack and made the call and got the helicopter to find me. I, you know, God woke him up ahead before I ever had the heart attack and had him drive clear up and find, and find me and call and he had to leave before I even had my first sign of a heart attack. That's how the hours it took to get there. So that's God's power. But my point is, these are, when, when I travel, when I meet people, I'm always looking for friends. Because this whole life is about friendship and spreading the word of God. Right? And I've had as many people witness to me in my life as I've witnessed to people. And I'm not going to go off on saying what they were pre not preaching, but what we were talking about was the core of the word. But how, how do we ever share the word if we don't become friends? 
If I just say, you know what, this is the way it is, you read Acts 2.38, if you don't like that, that's tough. You think he'd be a friend anymore? No. That's not how we do things as Christians. That's not how God did anything. Did God take somebody by the head and push them down into the Word and say, no, you take that? He offered it. It was our choice to take it or leave it, right? But God was always, Jesus Christ walking in this flesh was always a friend to anybody who wanted to be a friend with him. He was friends to people that didn't like him, that hated him. He was friends to them. When he had the power to say, send down how many angels and wipe them out. Because they're taking, they're, they're nailing me to that cross. And I'm going to die for this. But you know what? He could have got to the point and said, you know what? This is enough. Boom. Said one word and had legions of angels down there to just take and wipe them all out. But he loved us that much. Right? So we go out on this trip, and I meet this fourth, I think he's fourth generation, his name's Alan, uh, rancher in Utah. And he showed me the old homestead, the super, super smart man. Um, when you meet somebody like an old pioneer man, they, they know how to live off the land, Brother Tommy. They know how to survive. Because they've had to, they just they had to they they did what they did just to live, not just to worry about how am I going to get out of the house to make it to McDonald's. You know, they they had to pack enough food in. He told me every winter they'd have to get their food in place down at their cabin by the first of November, and they would not get, be able to come out till the end of May. And that's with us animals and everything. I mean, he had to have everything ready for his family and stay in them mountains because there was no getting out. He showed me pictures of the snow that was five foot deep. And it, it was, you know, my, my point was when we got all done with that, and I love history anyway, and, you know, is these people were tough. And he's still tough to this day. This man's still tough. Are we tough anymore as Christians? Do we really have what it takes? God's looking for a people that's going to serve him through the storms. Amen? And, you know, we're, I, I classify us all as warriors. If you're still in this church today and you're still showing up here, you're a warrior. Because you're, you're going to be fought and you're going to fight battles and warriors fight battles. But on, along the way with any war there becomes wounded soldiers, wounded warriors. Brother Lon, am I correct? And I wasn't in the military, my dad was, and, you know, I, I wish I would have, but, here, you know, these gentlemen here and, and Pastor Howard, but I've heard them all say, and Brother Rick, no man left behind. Right? Nobody left behind. So we have a warrior that's wounded, we pray him back and we pray we heal him by praying for them. Right. Not judging them, not what's going on, what happened, who cares? Is it, is it any of your business or my business what's going on? Zero. It's between God and them. Right? right? Just like with my battle when I went through it, between me and God. In my time it took to come back, God was ordained in that time. I, I could have said, yeah, I should have come back earlier, should have, could have, whatever. But God has his reasons. We will all learn from things that happen to us. Yeah, it wasn't pleasant. I, I mean, I, I, I actually walked in. I thought this ceiling was going to cave in on me because all the stuff I knew I'd done wrong or I walked away from God in my, in my mind, you know. I mean, I thought, man, this place is going to fall down on me and kill me. That, but that old devil, he just kept bringing it to me every day right up here, just bringing it. Nope, can't do it. You can't come back. You cannot do this. It's too big. It's been gone too long. You've done too much. And it, it'll get to you. It'll wear on you. But I'm here to tell you today, church, you can't go too far. There's no way you can go too far that he will not be there for you. All he wants us to do is say, in a, a, a wise words from an old gentleman, Brother Jimmy, what did he tell you? 
about coming back? Walk through the door. Boy, I never thought of that. Brother Jimmy had wise words. Walk through the door. How many do we need to hear that? How many listen to this on the live feed need to walk through the door? You know, the devil has lied to you for years and years, and you're not here. Why? Because you don't think you're eligible anymore. You don't think you're good enough anymore. You've done too much. Done, you, you know, God could never forgive me for everything I've done. Show me in the Bible. Show me where it says it. Only one unforgivable sin is blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, which means you're denying that Jesus Christ ever existed. The Holy Ghost is Jesus Christ. And blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. If you, have, if you haven't done that, I don't care. It, it doesn't make any difference. There's no, God does not have levels of sin. Now, we sure do. Right. You know, we have it. Now, I'll tell you what, we got, we can, we got a, a computer program for that. You did what? Well, you're number 23. You did this? Oh, you're number six. You get to the top, that's the ultimate worst. You know, well, God's like, what are you guys doing? All that blood that, you know, that underneath here, that cross, that water, and that baptism tank, that's blood. That's his blood. We're buried with him in baptism, right? Where does the level of water need to be for my sin? Where does it need to be for your sin? It covers all our sin. Every sin is forgiven. Every sin. But we sure don't like to hear it because the devil's sitting there saying, no, don't work that way. No. Nope. Brother Jim, you know there's a list. You've got to find it and get it out. Where do we fall? And we've got to work our way back. Where does it ever say work your way back? God always tells us in Scripture, today is the day of salvation. Today. Not tomorrow. Not next week. Not when you get yourself all fixed up. You quit smoking, you quit drinking, you quit talking about people, you quit this, you quit that, because it's all sin. Oh, but I've got all that, all that figured out, but I can't quit smoking. Who cares? Who cares? That's between you and God. You know how you quit smoking? Did you come to church? And not because the preacher or anybody, any of us say quit smoking. God dwells inside of us, and he will convict our heart of what we're doing wrong. He will also give us the strength to stop it. If I go up to you and say, Sister Helen, quit smoking, it's just going to make you mad. I'm just saying, there's, there's a parable here. <laughs> I don't either, but hey. I've done a whole lot worse than smoking. Um, but my point is, we, we, have to, we have to understand where we're really at with God. And I, you know, the further this goes on, on, and meeting these fine gentlemen out west and talking with them for a couple weeks and sitting around just visiting and, and learning history, but God just kind of told me in my spirit, that where are we at today? Where are we at? Are we strong enough? This, you know... I end, we, we ended up having the baptism yesterday, which was awesome. I didn't know if it happened or not. You know, God bless old brother Phil to come to be uh, baptized yesterday. And he showed up. I was so worried the devil would just get him down. You know how it works. And, but he come. And, you know, I, I talked to him for probably an hour before I baptized him. Went through all the scriptures. I marked the Bible up for him. And, you know, we did, did it all. And, and he, he was just reading through it, and he says, I'm going to treasure this Bible, and I'm going to treasure this word. And he's, I think he's 83 is what he told me. And he had a heart attack uh, several weeks ago, and he says he knew that he had to get ready. He knew. Because if he's still working. He still works part-time, which is like 32 hours a week, Okay. And he walks with a cane, and he, he struggles to walk, but you know what? He is a, a, such a strong-willed, fine man. He is. 
But he knew that he needed this. I never said a word to him about this. He knew God pricked his heart, and I told him, God pricked your heart to tell you, and I said, did you hear his call? He said, yes, I did, loud and clear. He says, I never believed I could hear God talk, but I heard him. Amen? Amen? He, he doesn't want any of us to perish, church. None of us to perish. So why, why are we going, walking around with our heads down, depressed, letting every care of this life drag us down through the dirt? And I've been right with you guys, trust me. I'm speaking to myself here. When we have everything we need for eternity. Are we waiting for this world to get better? It's not going to happen. Revelation tells us it's not going to get any better, church. We are, at the, we are in the end days. In the end days, this will fulfill itself, the revelation of this Bible, before Jesus Christ returns, and it looks really bad the more you read, and it's going to get really bad. Are we going to be able to hold on when it gets really bad? You ever, you ever challenge yourself and think about that? Are we strong enough? Are we rooted enough in this? Is our roots go deep? Are we planted in, in this soil of Jesus Christ to know that when that storm comes and that winds hit, like the, the, in Florida? Can you imagine the, when he says storms of life? When you see the, the video of that stuff that happened down there and just... You know, everything that man makes and even part of when what God allows to be taken away, it just, it's like nothing was ever there. Trees are gone, everything. Big old steel structures that were so sturdy and so strong, and it's like, no, no way that'll ever bend or be taken out. Well, it's gone. Because nothing is going to stop God. Absolutely nothing is going to stop God. Whatever we think we can make, build, or do that's so great, God shows us real quick, you are nothing. But we, we got to remember who we are and who he is. But this is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And, and like I was telling Phil yesterday, this is so easy, but it's so hard. For some people to just accept it and say, this is what it says, let's do it. Let's live it. It's the world makes it hard. The devil comes in and starts making you try to read between the lines. It's not there because, well, i got to give up this and that and this. I, I tell you, the older I get, giving up. I, there, there was a time in my life where I thought that when I was young. Well, i got to give all this up. My goodness, I'm, I'm having a good old time out there, and I'm coming to church and praising the Lord and going back to the world and going to work, and it's like, well, until Sunday, I'm still, I'm living the world. I'm just going to man up and tell you. That's how I was. I didn't have any roots with me when I started this with my wife. I had never been around this in my entire life. It's hard to change old paths. When you're raised that way for mom and daddy, and they didn't know any better either, because their, their parents didn't know any better. They were the same way. My grandparents, same way. That's a generation of not a good thing. And you that have had Christian background your whole life, praise God for it. Thank him every day for it. Because to come into this at 20-some years old and never been to church before in my life, to even, even I knew there was a God, but I'd never, I mean... I don't even know how to explain it. You just, you know, but you don't know. Maybe you don't care. I don't know what it is. Because when we're young, we're, we feel invincible, and we can just take on everything. Yeah, as we get old, man, Brother Dennis, I don't have it no more. I never did have it. I just thought I had it. <laughs> right? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so... Who, who is this here? You know, it, it, we talk about, you know, the, let me just turn to Hebrews real quick here. You don't have to stand or nothing. Uh, just, I just want to read a few scriptures here. Hebrews 5, uh, start at verse 11. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. For when, 
For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the world, the word of righteousness, and for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full of age, even those who by reason to use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. It says a whole lot there in that verse 14. And this goes right to you children, your young teenagers, as they're sitting here. Listen to what that says. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full of age. What's full of age? An old man like me? Doesn't say, does it? It says full of age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to do what? To discern both good and evil. If your children know how to discern good and evil, they're accountable. What's the Bible telling right there? Let's don't, let's don't blow this off, church. Let's read it for what it says. We need to be careful. And we need to be preaching and, t- and telling our kids and showing them the way. You know, I, I feel I got pretty good grandkids. They're not perfect by no means, but I feel like I got pretty good grandkids. But I know this. Before I even met this man out west, and I, and I of course, I lecture my grandkids, and you can ask them. I'm really bad about lecturing my grandkids. But I told him, I said, when you meet this Mr. Allen, I said, that's exactly who he is when you meet him, is Mr. and Sir, and yes, sir. He is is going to deserve respect, and he's going to expect respect. He He is from an age where you respected each other, and you talked that way. And sure enough, that's exactly how he was. And my grandkids did a fine job. But, you know, it's, it's so easy for kids today to want to talk over an adult in the conversation or root in, you know. Back in you, you, you folks that are my age, did you remember your mom and dad letting you do that? Was, that? was that allowed? I remember trying that a few times in the back of that hand, smacked me inside the head, and I, I, I figured it out. That was not a good time to talk. But today, it seems to be a way of life. The, the young kids take over the conversation and they finish it. And that's not respectful. I'm sorry. I'm, I may be stepping on toes, but I'm, I'm just telling you what the Bible says here. To discern both good and evil. So we talk about the being babes. We're, you know, most of us in this church are not babes anymore. And we can't be living like babes. And, and we, we have to be eating the strong meat and we have to be able to, and eating the strong meat, it's like I told Phil yesterday, I said, Phil, I said, you are now going to be equipped to tell others of what happened to you today, and these scriptures that I give you, and you pass this on, because this is no good if it's not passed on. What good is it if you hold it and you hide it? What good is the plan of salvation if you don't share it? It goes nowhere. It'll set folded up in that Bible, and nobody gets to hear it. Nobody gets to be witness to about it. Is there, are any of our friends, family, are they, what, why do we think we're better and they don't deserve to hear this? Because that's really what it comes to. Oh, I'm shy. I can't really talk. Are you going to be shy, and you see it their life, and you, you, you know they're living a horrible life, and you want them to come to Jesus Christ, and all of a sudden something happens, and they're gone? Is that what, what's that, how's that going to feel on your shoulders when they should have been that friend, that family member to step up and say, hey, I want to show you this word, what it says. Not what I say, what the word says. I want to share this with you. I want to give you a chance, like God gave me a chance to have eternal life. Now, they don't have to hear it, but you speak it and you're done. God takes over the rest. We can't save anybody. Only God can save. But we can give the words that will lead it to the salvation of Jesus Christ and them people. Because I found in my life that when we can say things to people, you think it went in one ear and out the other, and they had no idea what you said, didn't care, did not a world, a difference. And I would talk about time with Jesus Christ. 
Years down the road, something changes. And all of a sudden, they're on fire for God. That the Bible talks as our words are seeds. We're planting seeds of faith. When we speak this word, that seeds of faith that enter the, the soul of a person, and it will grow. Now, they have a choice to do whatever they need to do, They where they want to do. They have a choice. But in, and I'm going to wrap it up here. You know, this, we talk about this constant devil and what he does to us. You know, I, just, I guess I want to ask a question. You know, who is this devil? Let's go to Isaiah chapter 14. If they come back to the music here, I'm about done. Isaiah 14, let's start at verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. I will be what? I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that, shall see, they that see there shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying... Now let's listen to what this says. This, we just heard about this big old strong Lucifer. Okay? This is what it's saying. And consider the saying, Is this the man that made the earth tremble, that did shake the kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of the prisoners? All the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, every one in his own house. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, and as raiment of those who are slain, thrust through with a sword to go down to the stones of the pit, and the carcass trodden under their feet. Who is this, who is this devil, this Lucifer? And we're going to, what they're telling, what the Bible's telling us right there, we're going to see him and think, he caused all this. He, he tried to destroy my life from the time I was born until I went to glory. This is him. Meaning, really? I'm serious. Think about that. And he's telling us, yeah, he has power over our, to, to give us thoughts in our mind. But the whole thing is, he is telling right here, O Lucifer, the son of the morning, how are there cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? He basically told God that, hey, I'm more powerful than you are. I can do a better job at this than you can. God kicked him out of heaven along with all of his angels. I'm not sure I quite understand all that, but I'm telling you this much. They went to their own place, which is hell, but he wasn't alone. He was kicked out, and he had angels with him. And his body was made as a great instrument. So he had the most beautiful music. And you think about music. Music is such a blessing when we hear the music for the uplifting of Jesus Christ, but look what the music has done to the world as far as the destruction of the young people and everybody who listens to things that sound good but all the words are death. There's no life in it. It's all death. Because the devil can make things sound really, really good. Really good. And we have to be aware, church. We, we just have to... We, we can't give up. We can't give in. We have to understand who we are, what power we have. And, and Lloyd's right. We can do it. This is so simple. This plan of salvation is so simple. Every time I go through this whole plan of salvation, 
It's like, it's, it's every time I read it to somebody, it's like, how is the world struggling with this so hard? Because it's so simple. But yet, nobody wants it. The church world doesn't want it. They don't want the truth. They want to go their way. They want to bend it all up and make it fit their, their procedures. And, and the last thing I want to leave you with is, and Tony touched on it uh, Friday night. He did a great job, by the way, Brother Tony. Um, love is the most important thing. We'll never be able to give anything out of this Bible to anybody without that love in our heart and having that, you know, to be a friend, you have to, be, to have a friendship, you have to be a friend. You have to be somebody that somebody will like, somebody you're not judging, you're not, you're not creating an atmosphere of tension. You, you need to be off sides and be loving. And, you know, I tell the young I tell them, not the young men, but I tell the men in the back about every week, that scripture that never leaves me is blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. Every time we find ourselves in a situation that we feel that old build up of I want to be right, I'm going to be right, I'm going to tell them no matter what, I'm going to just force my way on it, that's not a peacemaker, church. I will never deny the word or walk away from the word, but God says all things in decency and order. You, it, for me to have my way all the time is never going to be God's will. God will take over the situation. He will run the problem and fix, figure the problem out, but we have to love, love, love. We have to love each other. When a warrior is wounded and he's out of church and he's been gone for years, we need to love them back, okay? Not judge time. Not let's get a list of what, what level of sin did they do, and we'll work them way back through that list. No. Talking about a list, let me just tell you about the, what Phil shared with me yesterday at his church. He felt this urgent need to get baptized. And I believe there is urgency to be baptized. I believe if you're not, and you're not done you know, correctly with what Jesus Christ is who laid out the plan. This isn't my idea, and it's what I showed Phil Nicodemus is a perfect example. That's red letter, Jesus Christ. You must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. You have to be born again. Okay? So he wanted to, and he's like, well, he didn't want a lot of people watching him. So some people are that way. They don't want a big crowd of people. And I'm going to reach out to this church. I'm going to reach out to the people watching. If you want to be baptized and you want to do it, on a, on a way that you don't have many people around you or just whoever you pick to be around you, we'll do it. Don't think we ne need to have a crowd. Don't think we need to have a party. If that is not how you're made up and you don't feel like doing it, I'm not here to tell you you're wrong. That's a personal thing. Baptism is a personal thing to say you need to do, and it's the most important thing you can do in your life, but don't let that stop you from doing it feeling like, well, I don't want a whole church gazing at me, you know, down in the water. And, you know, we're in water and you get wet and everybody's worried about your clothes sticking up. I've worried about my clothes, period, in every floor. <laughs> Nothing fits us right back there trying to, you know, go in. But, you know, I mean, the, it, the devil will work on you and make you feel like, well, what if something happened? Everybody's going to think something or say something. Well, rest assured, people, if you want done in a weeknight, a weekend, during the day, this church will make it happen. You will be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and you will be given a Bible of the King James only. We will highlight all the scriptures, the plan of salvation. It will be your name, and when you got baptized, and it will be yours to keep with you for the whole time you are alive. That's yours. So if you want it done, and you want it done on a loan or a basis like that, please get a hold of us. Because it seems to be more and more that that's going on. But his church, they baptize once a month. And they got a list. <laughs> and you got to fill out this paperwork and then and see if, if you, I may be confusing that, but there's a list uh, if they can that month or not, if they can baptize you or, or whatever. But 
But you know what? It, it is what it is. But I'll tell you where our list is. If you need it done, you're on the first list. So you need it done today, we're going to do it. If you need it done tonight at 10 o'clock, I'll be here at 10 o'clock tonight. We're going to do it. Okay, because like he said, he goes, I don't even know if I'll be here in another month to wait. So what am I waiting on? No, don't wait. The Bible says throughout the whole Bible, today is the day of salvation. Don't wait for tomorrow. Don't wait for two weeks or a month or next year. So I, I want to leave you with that, but I, all of you that are listening and, you know, I say it on the live stream, it's the most important thing you'll do. You'll have a church home. You're going to have all everything you need in Scripture to back it up for everything we do here, and it's God's Word only what we do here. It's not our thoughts. It's not our own personal plan. It is the true plan of salvation. So would everybody stand, please? The altar's open. God still forgives. God still is, has, he's on the throne. He's never left the throne. All of our troubles, our problems, our trials, bring them up here and lay them on the altar. He will set us free of all the things that are binding us. Everything. Every chain will be broken. But I encourage you to all come and pray today.